Um, but I think we'll we'll get going. So if everybody else could um, turn their videos off, except for you, Richard, and uh, mute themselves, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Kate Crosby and I'm one of Richard's students and um, I am uh, delighted that he's agreed to join us today. Um, I, I was thinking about introducing him and I was thinking, how does one even begin to introduce a world famous scholar whose writings in the field of Pali and Buddhist studies have changed the field and whom once met is never forgotten? I could talk about his books, <laughs> beginning with Precept and Practice, the first work to bring together in-depth textual studies and ethnography, first published in 1971 and still a really important resource half a century later, which both in content and style, as have his other writings, have inspired subsequent generations, including people in the audience today. Um, I could try mentioning his other works, Uncovering Early Buddhist History. Uh, I think even listing them would take up more time than a usual introduction. So Theravada Buddhism, Buddhism Transformed, How Buddhism Began, uh, The Perfect Generosity of Prince Vasantra, kind and, Kindness and Compassion as a Means to Nirvana, uh, What the Buddha Taught, Buddhism and Pali. So these are the recent works. I could mention his presidency of the Pali Text Society, which saw many important works being published, his editorship of the Clay Sanskrit Library, which uh, produced some of the be most beautiful translations and uh, parallel to wonderful editions of um, a large number of Sanskrit texts, making them very accessible and helping many students. I could mention his founding of the Oxford Centre of Buddhist Studies. I could talk about the number of students he nurtured while Bowdoin Chair of Sanskrit at Oxford University, peopling the current generations of Buddhist studies scholars around the world. But I thought I'd actually start with my beginning. And the first thing I ever knew about Richard Gombrich was actually about his earlobes. So I was, <laughs> I attended a, a Tibetan um, temple, I suppose, in a, in a house in suburban um, Oxford. And the first thing I heard was, oh, Richard Gombrich, yes, huge earlobes, <laughs> because they thought he was uh, close to becoming a Buddha. Um, and the next introduction I had to him was when I was actually a student uh, studying Sanskrit and um, my Sanskrit teacher teaching, um, teaching introduction to Sanskrit, Jim Benson, was very excited as it came up towards the end of term, towards Christmas, by this special guest that we had coming. And I hadn't long left school, and it sounded to me like Father Christmas was about to arrive. And it, I wasn't really wrong, because over the subsequent years, um, as I studied with Richard, learning was always fun, never dull, and replete with gifts, from the amazing meals and house parties hosted by his wife. So his wife is the uh, renowned Indologist and specialist in Tantra, Sanjukta Gupta, to the scholars he brought through the door to add richness to our education and the and uh, yes, yeah, just a wonderfully rich education. And I could mention some of the ethical issues he championed because he was also very active in the political and social life of the university and further afield. Um, Richard was also aware of the practicalities of pursuing scholarship, particularly if you weren't from a standard background and he took care to ensure his students were employed. And it was only really when he gave me some work sorting out some of his materials that it began to dawn on me who my teacher was and what he had achieved and what he did. And I was so overwhelmed by this. I um, There was a uh, some sticky notes on his desk. It was a pad of sticky notes in the shape of a pig. And I wrote on one of these, a professor's life is a lazy life. And I stuck it on his notice board. And for me, this was particularly important because my mother had once met him and made him speechless. It was the only time I ever saw Richard speechless. And she made him speechless by asking him, what he did with all those long holidays. <laughs> he was unable to answer. Anyway, the sticky note remained there gathering dust until Richard's retirement 16 years ago, when you would have thought he would have taken a well-earned rest. Mm -mm, not a bit of it. He continues very busy with the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies, teaching Pali courses, and now online, and continuing to write. And most recently, even, even moving to a new research area. So now working on Fu Kuan Shan Buddhism in Taiwan. So today he's found time in that busy schedule to join us and speak to a topic that brings together these strands, 
the importance of the so-called transfer of merit for understanding the history of Buddhism. Richard, thank you so much, and over to you. Thank you very much, Kate. I was brought up on the adage, flattery will get you nowhere, but that has been falsified. It will at least get you to a chair in King's College London. Well, today, my talk is called The Importance of the So-Called Transfer of Merit for Understanding the History of Buddhism. And in studying Buddhist history, I have mostly worked on its earliest period, the time of the Buddha himself. Recently, however, I've become interested in Chinese Buddhism, although, alas, I don't know any Chinese. In 2005, I spent a month teaching at the Buddhism Center of the University of Hong Kong. I wonder how it's doing now. And there I learned from colleagues about Tai Xu, T-A-I-X-U, the Chinese monk who between the two world wars in what he called sometimes humanistic Buddhism, of course these are English translations, humanistic Buddhism or Buddhism for this life. And I also learned about Thich Nhat Hanh, who renamed Taishu's humanistic Buddhism as engaged Buddhism. And under that name, it has since conquered most of the Western world. Taishu took as his starting point that the Buddhism around him, Chinese Mahayana, was primarily concerned with rituals for the dead. He deplored this as a morbid obsession. Then I gradually realized what a vital role rituals for the dead played in the Buddha's own environment. And my short talk today will carry the story a bit further. I think everyone listening to me probably knows that Buddhists believe in rebirths for all sentient beings. The cycle of death and rebirth goes on forever. Its beginning is a mystery, and only the enlightened can recall their former births. The only escape from the cycle is to attain enlightenment, which is also called nirvana. Rebirth takes place in one of many destinies. Heavens, which are above our human world, hells, which are beneath it, or in this world as a human or an animal, or a ghost. I shall be returning to the ghosts. In, their Buddha, in the Buddha's day, there was, in, were in his society two widespread theories about the fate of the dead. One theory was that the dead require reg regular recognition and worship from their direct descendants and will repay them by acting as guardian deities. The other theory was the theory which can be referred to as karma. Both in India and in China, the two main cultures which contain many Buddhists, most of the population is patrilineal, so that social identity is determined by the males. Sons, particularly eldest sons, dominate funeral rituals, as they do most features of family life, responsible for maintaining the rituals they inherit. The entire emphasis of the tradition is not on explanatory theories, but on ritual performance, which tends to be prescribed in minute detail and is often supervised by a priest. Initially, at death, all follow the same course, starting where they died though after a while they may move on to a heaven or a hell. Ethical considerations enter only at the point where there is such a bifurcation between going up or going down. What happens to women when they die is considered very little or not at all in the ancient sources. Karma, which in Sanskrit means action, in Sanskrit, it is a Sanskrit word, uh, it hardly ever refers to a purely physical movement, but it means an action which is significant, whether it be a right or an act which has a moral aspect, whether good or bad. 
such an act is deemed to entail consequences, pleasant or unpleasant, for the doer, whether in this life or in a future life. The basic metaphor of karma is agricultural, planting a seed and reaping a harvest. In many contexts, karma is understood confusingly to refer not to an action, but to the results of an action. In Sanskrit, that's karma vipaka, vipaka meaning the maturation of a karma. This theory is gender blind. This one applies to women in just the way that it applies to men. In contrast to the theory, this theory ethicizes the world, in particular human beings. That is, one's fate after death is determined by one's ethical record, which goes back into the infinite past. According to the Buddha, the ethical quality of an act lies in the motive behind it. In one canonical text, the Buddha even says, I say that karma is intention. In the Brahminism of his day, karma primarily referred to an enjoined ritual act, and a bad karma was a prohibited act. But the Buddha turned all this on its head and considered ritual in itself to be ethically neutral. This means that performing ritual has no bearing on one's future. And from the religious point of view, according to the Buddha, it is simply a waste of time. A good, that is a well-intentioned act, will bring good results for its agent. A malign act will sooner or later bring the agent bad consequences. These bad consequences look like punishment, but that view is not quite right in that there is no punisher. It is a law of nature that the punishment will arrive and who or what delivers it is not predetermined. In the Buddha's teaching, one may regret an action, but strictly speaking, there's no such thing as atonement. If I do something wicked, I shall suffer for it. My bad karma has sown a seed which I shall harvest, but the situation is not as desperate for the wicked as this may seem. Because although one cannot expunge bad karma, cannot wipe it out, one can counterbalance it by performing good karma. The ceremonies performed by Chinese Buddhists, which in English are often called penances, perform that function. As I shall explain, by wishing to transfer the merit one is gathering to the dead, typically one's own dead ancestors, one creates for oneself good karma, which one hopes will outweigh at least some of one's own bad karma. The Buddha saw our lives as consisting of various continuities, both physical and mental. Continuity means and meant that each stage helped to determine the next one. And the most important continuity is ethical, the continuity of moral intention, which is to say of karma. As the English proverb says, sow an act, reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. Karmic continuity lasts not only within one life, but through a sequence of births until the sowing ceases with the attainment of nirvana, which is the extinction of passion, hatred, and delusion. For Buddhists, each of us has a biography, which is in essence simply a chronicle of our record as an ethical agent. And that record extends over innumerable lives. When expounding the Buddha's thought, one cannot repeat often enough the centrality of moral intention. Since the intention of any human being, old or young, rich or poor, male or female, is the same kind of thing, the Buddha is the first person in recorded history to have propounded a theory of human equality. And that equality inheres in our character as moral agents. 
At the same time, it is no less essential to the theory of karma that every intention belongs to an individual. We might say it occurs in a single brain. The agent who does the act is the same as the person who then experiences the result of what they intended. No matter how long a time or how many lives may intervene between the action and the result. The idea that the form in which one is reborn depends on the moral quality of one's karma appears in Vedic literature in the earliest Upanishads and in Jainism and in Buddhism. Though it has so far not been possible to date these three things with any precision, the first two, that is the Brahminism and the Jainism, the first two seem to be a bit earlier than Buddhism since the Buddha responds to some of their teachings, although he does not name his sources. Gananath Obeseka calls this ethicizing rebirth, which in the cases of Jainism and Buddhism leads to ethicizing the universe. At first, the basic model remains simple. This world is the arena of action. The other world is the arena of payoff. When the payoff is complete, you come back to this world and start together and start again. However, what comes to characterize all the Indian soteriologies, Brahminical, Jain and Buddhist, is that they add to rebirth the idea that by certain means one can escape from this recycle, and it is such an escape or liberation which constitutes salvation, the ultimate goal of the religion. As Obiasekara writes, there can no longer be a single place after death for those who have done good and those who have done bad. The other world must minimally be split into two, a world of retribution, normally called hell, and a world of reward called heaven. All the traditions I have mentioned come to agree that since all lives are finite and a good rebirth will uh, will inevitably come to an end, the best solution is liberation. In cosmology, Hindus keep the underlying binary model. It is humans and the higher animals who are the moral agents, and at death they go to a heaven or a hell to be rewarded or punished. Though escaping rebirth is ultimately the best destiny, most people aim for a good rebirth in heaven or in a good station on earth. And ethnography suggests that despite their different official doctrines, very many Jains and Buddhists share that attitude, which leads to much inconsistency. For Hindus, it is in general impossible to alter one's place in the world after death. And therefore, one's enjoyment or suffering is also unalterable, because that existence is only for payoff. They do not believe that those born in a heaven can continue to, go, to do good. In post-Vedic texts, the general picture is that sins when not expiated by penances or by state punishment lead to hell. And then, owing to some remnants of the evil deeds, to rebirth as lower animals and then as decrepit or diseased human beings. That comes from P. V. Kane's work. The Buddhists, by contrast, have always gone to the extreme of ethicizing the entire universe. According to Buddhism, all sentient beings, however situated, from gods at the top down through human beings, animals, ghosts, and ultimately even those suffering in hell, are part of one single moral community capable of good and bad moral intentions, which will inevitably affect the character of their future rebirths. In this, they resemble human society, including all castes and both genders. This follows from the Buddha's radical position that karma is created by intention, and that in turn means that any individual's moral standing, which could be said to be the most important thing about them, has no connection with any physical feature. It is entirely due to go what goes on 
invisibly, of course, in their heads. Thus, any sentient being, whether human, animal, god or ghost, continues to have moral responsibility and can, for example, by be influenced by Buddhist sermons. The Brahmin or Hindu view, which provides a kind of framework for all their mortuary rituals, is that the dead person, who is initially referred to as the preta, the one who has passed on, goes through three phases. The first follows death immediately. It's very like what popular belief in the West has tended to think of as a ghost. It is in this form that the dead person inspires most fear and or disgust. On the anniversary of the death, there is a crucially important ceremony called a shraddha, which marks stage two, the point at which the dead man joins his ancestors and moves from being a praetor to being a pitter or father. By dying, the man left your kin group and now you have restored him to it by making him an ancestor. The mourner's picture of the ghost in the period leading up to his change of status is very fluid. The ghost is thought to inhabit a body provided by the mourners, yet it is also a disembodied spirit and may also be present in a person or animal. This diversity of form provides the relatives with the opportunity to feed the ghost through several different channels, which minimizes the risk of failure and providing them with greater peace of mind. How was the Brahmin ritual adapted to a Buddhist context? A modern Westerner who accepts the Buddha's teachings on karma can see no logical reason why one of the kinds of being among which one may be reborn is a hungry ghost. What in Pali is called a peta, and in Sanskrit, a preta, the one who passes on. There are two books in the Pali canon, the Peta Vatu and the Vimana Vatu, which concern particular spirits of the dead. To the Westerner, these rather crude works may well seem superfluous. Surely the sufferings of the peta could be accommodated in hell. And why are the virtuous subjects of the Vimanavatu in their stereotyped celestial carriages, or the like, singled out from others who are reborn in a heaven? The answer here lies among mortuary rites. While the Buddha taught that rituals were pointless and laid out a life for the ordained, in which the part played by ritual was minimal, he didn't try to interfere with any lay customs which did not involve violence, as of course animal sacrifice does. Though there is very little mention in the canon of lay ritual, one can probably deduce from the edicts of the Emperor Asoka that rituals involving extravagant expenditure, as mortuary rites sometimes did, also met with the Buddha's disapproval. Uh, sorry, with Ahsoka's disapproval. In one canonical text, a Brahmin says to the Buddha that Brahmins practice funerary rituals in which they pray that the gifts which they give to the officiating Brahmins, gifts which may, must include food, may by this means be enjoyed by the dead. And the questioner asks whether this really works. The Buddha's initial reply is that it does not work if the dead relative is reborn in hell, or as an animal, or as a human, or as a god. But it does work if he is reborn as a praetor, in which case he lives on what his kinsmen supply. This is Brahmin orthodoxy. When asked further, the Buddha replies that the relatives who are praetors will enjoy the actual offering instead. And it can never be the case that one has no relatives who have been reborn as praetors. But in any case, no act of giving can fail to have a result. This implies that the custom should be continued. 
according to the Buddha. In this text, there is no mention of the transfer of merit. So the Buddha is simply telling the Brahmin what he expects and hopes to hear, that the objects, such as food, donated do pass to the dead and are then enjoyed in much the same way as they would be by living human beings. This suggests that what became the standard Buddhist response to this situation, the transfer of merit, was probably devised and followed towards the end of the Buddha's life. The transfer of merit, the center point of my lecture, is an ingenious doctrine which came to permeate the whole of Buddhist practice in every Buddhist tradition. Since the moral quality of an act resides solely in the intention behind it, one might deduce that if I sincerely wish to give someone a dollar, the good karma I have thereby earned is not affected by whether in the end I give the dollar or not. That would not, however, be a correct interpretation. Because just as in English law, whether an intention is carried out cannot be left out of account. And it is assumed that the intention was greater if it was acted on, just as murder is a crime worse than manslaughter. The Buddha's emphasis on intention has, however, also had the further result, which may initially surprise us, though it isn't illogical. A good intention may evoke a similar good intention in an onlooker, and the latter thereby earns as much merit as the first intender. Thus, if I intend to give a poor man a dollar, someone who learns of my intention will equally generous and thus develop an intention just like mine, regardless of whether that intention is finally carried out. The result of this recalls the English expression of having your cake and eating it. If I want to feed my parents, whether they be alive or dead, that good intention contributes to my store of merit. If someone then learns of my feelings and is inspired to imitate them, they acquire merit too, although this takes away none of my merit. The practical consequence is that when I do something good or just even intend to do it, I should inform other people or other beings about my feelings, because that will inspire them to earn merit for themselves. Thus, to hide one's light under a bushel is much worse than pointless. The English term transfer of merit is seriously misleading because nothing gets transferred. It is just like lighting one candle from another. One must remember that in Brahminism, one can expunge bad karma from one's record by performing a penance, but not so in Buddhism. The only way to avoid paying for bad karma is to acquire enough good karma to outweigh it, and mortuary rites give the dead an opportunity for creating good karma by witnessing generous acts and emulating the intentions behind them. When merit transference is mentioned, it's all too easy to be misled by the metaphor into talking as if merit were like money, something one can accumulate in a bank account. And indeed, many Buddhists do appear to think of it like that. The historian Richard Seaford has argued that the widespread use of money in ancient India came about in the same period as the Buddhist teaching of karma. Richard Seaford writes that the metaphysics of money involves the belief that we are primarily individual agents and only secondarily, if at all, members of a larger social entity. The power of money can increase independence even from deity. It is possible that there is an element of coincidence here because both the teaching of the transfer of merit and the increase in the use of money can be explained independently. Nevertheless, the fact that both seem to have occurred in the Buddha's environment late in his lifetime, near the end of the 5th century BC, 
cannot but impress the historian. It is customary for Buddhists to feed monks, if possible, in one's own home at certain fixed intervals of time after the death of a relative. In Singhala, these are all called matakadanes, meaning that they're gifts made for the, gel, for the dead. Though the food is offered to the monks, with the thought that their consuming it is tantamount to its being consumed by the ghosts, the praetors, giving to the Sangha and transferring the merit of that act came to be seen as more reliable than the simple act of providing food and drink. The stated purpose of the Petavatu was to establish the superior merit of making gifts to the Buddhist holy order and their efficacy as a means of releasing the praetors from their state of woe. The trans transfer consists of making a statement in which the person who is making merit, for example, by giving food to the Sangha, calls the attention of a third party, for example, the ghost of a recently dead family member, to what is going on. So the praetor uses this opportunity to empathize with the donor and enter into the same state of mind, which is to think how I would like myself to be offering that food to the Sangha. While a Praetor has little or no opportunity to perform meritorious acts independently, the acquisition of merit through a thought process is not confined to a ritual occasion. In the Majjhima Nikaya, in the Pali Canon, in a list of recommendations how a monk should behave, the Buddha says, if a monk should wish that it bring great advantage to his dead kinsmen to recollect him with faith in their hearts, he should fulfill the precepts and not neglect meditation. And the commentator says, if the dead relative acquires faith in the virtue of his monastic kinsman and just recollects him, that is capable of keeping the deceased from an evil rebirth for many thousands of kalpas of eons and causing him finally to reach the deathless state of nirvana. This surely added a new dimension to the transfer of merit. This isn't the end of the historian's story about the transfer of merit. On the contrary, it's rather the beginning. The next chapter in the story concerns the gods. In, the Theravada, in Theravada Buddhism, the population of the heavens consists of gods, but these gods are unlike what adherents of other religions think of as gods. Just as a virtuous person may receive a reward for their virtue by being reborn as a fortunate, that is to say, a rich person in this world, an even more virtuous person may go on better by being reborn in heaven. Conditions in heaven are excellent, but not perfect. For instance, the lifespan of a god is long, but it is finite. And at death, they rejoin the cycle in which all li li other living beings are entrapped until they finally evade rebirth by attaining nirvana. While karma, good and bad, is, as it were, the motor which drives the cosmic mechanism of transmigration, we learned from our Theravadin informants in Sri Lanka that the populate the heavens are not thought of as making merit, and in this respect they resemble those who are suffering in hell. Those who follow Obiaseka's analysis of the development of karma theory will find this easy to understand. That is, originally before Buddhism, heavens and hells were thought of as places or conditions in which, in which one received the payoff for what one had done on being on, on, oh, sorry for what one had done on earth, not as places where one generated fresh karma. After receiving the payoff, one was reborn on earth and started over again, as it were, with a blank account. Therefore, this Theravadin view of the matter is a historical memory, even if those who adhere to it are not aware of the historical reasons for their doing so. They resort to, other resort, sorry, to other explanations, which they find consistent with Buddhist cosmology. 
when we did field work in Sri Lanka, our informants told us that life in heaven is too comfortable, causing heaven dwellers to forget the basic truth that all life is dukkha, unsatisfactory. This then becomes used as a justification for the Theravadin custom of transferring one's merit to the gods after performing any act of piety. The gods can't earn merit for themselves, so we must do it for them, drawing their attention to what we are doing so that they can gain merit by empathy, the normal condition for transfer of merit. I suspect there may be yet another reason underlying this, again a historical one. In this culture, when one asks a spirit to bestow a material benefit, one promises that if the request is granted, one will respond with a quid pro quo, as normally occurs in relationships between human beings. Initially in Buddhism, the gods were inherited from the cultural environment as part of the cosmic furniture and played no part in the soteriology. Buddhists believed that there existed in most, or perhaps all societies, many powerful superhuman beings who lived in heaven or on earth and had the power to grant petitionary prayers, requests. These beings were known by words which are commonly and reasonably translated as gods. I'm not aware that the matter is discussed in any ancient text, so it is possible that all the three explanations are correct. However, the last one is, to my mind, the least likely. Even in cases where they were perhaps not able to theorize about it, the Buddhists who believed in and might pray to those gods were vividly aware of the distinction between petitionary and spiritual prayer, and knew that the two categories demanded completely different attitudes and behavior. In brief, a spiritual good, which typically comes from one's own death and future lives, can be attained only by one's own efforts. A superior being, such as the Buddha, may help one to attain it, but that help takes the form of wise, wise advice, which explains what one can do to help oneself. This technique, which permits the gods to acquire merit, is virtually the same as is applied for the recently dead. The intended results, however, are different. The gods, in return, are supposed to give people protection and grant their wishes for this life. So the positive functions which Brahmin ideology ascribes to ancestors, the Buddhists firmly assign to gods. In the Buddhist interaction with Pretas, however, the benefits flow the other way. Now, in the 19th and 20th centuries, the Westerners, often agents of the Christian colonial powers, who first observed Buddhist societies, were in many cases seriously confused. Finding that local Buddhist populations believed in gods and interacted with them, they criticized those Buddhists for being bad Buddhists, who, they said, had lost sight of the Buddha's teachings. Only rather recently, when scholars began to point out that in the earliest scriptures, notably the Pali Canon, canon, gods played a similar role to that which they play today, did the Westerners come to realize their misunderstanding. But this clarification has still not reached all the authors of textbooks and works of reference. Almost now, now the climax of the lecture brief. The practice of transferring merit led to a watershed in the history of Buddhism. Originally, one could only receive merit by wanting to do so and empathizing with an act of merit which one knew about by hearing a sermon or whatever. But in the Mahayana, the standard way of transferring one's own act of merit was by expressing the wish that it accrued to the credit of all living beings, whether they were aware of it or not. I repeat, whether they were aware of it or not. The crucial link between karma and intention was thus broken in the Mahayana. Merit could still be created by a meritorious intention, but over and above this, it also floated around the universe in a way which 
I think, remains of, of how people imagine luck. The proliferation of the transfer of merit created the salient features which have characterized Mahayana Buddhism ever since. If one could so easily acquire merit through some act of mer empathy without even being aware of it, this weakened the rigor of the Buddha's teaching that we are solely and wholly responsible for our own. In the Mahayana, supernatural figures, whether called Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, or gods, could both acquire and distribute merit as they pleased, and could do this in any situation, anywhere in the universe. A comparativist, oh sorry, a comparativist may be forgiven for claiming that despite obscuring the cosmology by introducing so many categories of living beings, and sophisticated ontologies, Mahayana Buddhism became a polytheism, poly, sorry, a polytheism. Whether one calls non-Mahayana Buddhism theistic is really a matter of choice. It believes in the existence of gods, but certain, no less certainly, those gods are very unlike the non-Buddhist theists non do normally believe in. So that's why the transfer of merit is a basic building block of all Mahayana Buddhism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gomber, for that uh, very thought-provoking talk. Uh, we'd like to open for Q&A, uh, but before we do that, uh, may I quickly uh, announce the talk for next Friday, uh, which is the 16th of October. Uh, we will be having with us uh, Dr. Chotima Chotora Wong, who is uh, one of the most interesting historians uh, working today. She's in Thailand at Silver Korn University. Her talk will be on uh, Wihan at Watapang Tonglang Sukhothai, uh, Cultural Linkages with Sri Lanka and Myanmar. So that is next Friday at the same time. Um, at this time, we'd like to uh, open for questions for Professor Gombrich. Uh, so uh, just to remind everyone, uh, this Q&A is being recorded. Uh, you can answer your question in, in one of two ways. First of all, you can uh, tap the hand icon on the floating menu bar on your screen, uh, or you can type your question in the meeting chat. Uh, so uh, you know, please, please go ahead with any questions that you may have. Yes, I see a, a question from uh, Venerable Kamai Damasami. Um, Venerable <coughs> Kamai Damasami, would you like to um, unmute yourself to ask your question, please? Uh, hello, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. And quite nice to see you uh, in good health. Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to remind me uh, to, to choose my memory. What you talk about today, uh, what you are talking about today, what's the difference uh, with the article you have written long ago about transform merit? The article. Um, yes, the subject matter of my talk today was it is entirely different from that. Um, it's perfectly compatible with that. I mean, that takes that analyzes how the transfer of merit arises, it doesn't then go into the, uh, what I do here, give three routes by which this could have arrived. And it certainly doesn't have anything to say about, then that's the biggest point of my lecture, um, how since transfer of merit in early Buddhism, in Theravada, depends on a conscious wish that it be transferred, both by the giver and by the receiver, and that is not the case in Mahayana, it makes it a very different kind of religion from Theravada Buddhism. So it's really, uh, I think, uh, there's really no overlap 
if there is an overlap, it's because in the early part of the lecture, as I'd been warned that I would have a very mixed audience who would not necessarily know anything about early Buddhism, I had to give some factual detail about that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. I, I saw a hand raised by uh, Peter Harvey, but then I also saw that uh, the sign that he is leaving. I don't know. Uh, uh, Peter, are you, if you're there, do you want to unmute yourself to ask your question, please? Yeah. Okay. A um, couple of points. Uh, another aspect of it in early Buddhism, the sharing of merit in, in early Buddhism, some in the Diga, where there's the idea that if your parents have died, you, you say, I will give alms on their behalf when they are dead. And that brings in perhaps the aspect, if you've inherited things from them, that's part of your resources that you give. So in a sense, you're giving their goods, <laughs> some of their goods <laughs> as well. That's a, just another aspect. Well, the well, other thing is in the... Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, I don't. Yeah. And the other thing is at the other end, the Mahayana end, for example, in Pure Land Buddhism, if you know that Amitabha Buddha is very pure and generous and transferring merit, and you, you can rejoice at that. So that still brings in intention, does it not? And you can well, share some of his... In Pure Land you know, Buddhism, of course, they don't do away with intention. I would never dream to suggest mm -hmm. that. But you can also operate without intention. I mean, they go, in fact, further than anybody else, because um, the the sort of they consider that the high point of their religion, do they not, is that the Buddha uh, is particularly happy to save those who are purely who are entirely wicked. So, yes, but they still need faith, don't they? They, yeah, they yes. still need the faith which makes that connection. No, yeah, they've got the, but they have all, all kinds of bad, any amount of bad karma, which the uh, can be overcome by the, the, by the Buddha. But that's only, of course, in pure land Buddhism. That isn't a very mm. widespread doctrine, although you can say it is because pure land Buddhism is widespread. Mm -hmm. As for the thing about the parents, that's a, that's Peter. That is simply a sort of. Um, a, how shall I put it? That's a way about giving your, 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 uh, you, you rejoice in your parents' merit. That's what you do. I mean, a commentator writes about what you just said about the par your parents' merit. The commentator would un unravel that to say, because the, there's a, the parents have some good merit, you know about it, as they are happy that you should do. If they concealed it from you, it wouldn't work. But they, if you know about it, then the, 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 good, the merit uh, also can be, as it were, transferred. It's, it's, in other words, it's duplicated. The merit can be duplicated ad infinitum, but only by conscious effort. That's the point. And yeah. in my, it's, it's quite simple. You can boil the whole thing of what I'm saying, but you wouldn't believe it I, if I boiled it down that much, that, that everything all that is different about the whole thing is the consciousness of what you're doing and always the intentionality. The intentionality is crucial for early Buddhism and can yeah. be regarded as irrelevant by a Mahayanist. Yes, although it's, it can still play a part in the Mahayana. But it's not necessary. Your, your your main point is it's not necessary in the Mahayana. No, and in daily Mahayana, so to speak, it is really doesn't come because you, with anything that you do, you say anything good, you say I um, may all living beings prosper from this uh, through this good act that I've done. You no, you don't ever claim that all living beings actually know. Mm -hmm. But of course, with the bodhisattvas, they have a reputation for being very good. So people don't necessarily need to know about the specific, you could argue. They could still rejoice at them in general. No, no, but I'm talking about you. You, Peter, the agent, the Buddhist. Yeah, the Buddhist. sure. Uh-huh. You don't, I'm afraid. Well, say I, 
reputation for being that good. You have a very good reputation, but not quite up to that level. <laughs> <laughs> right, but anyway, yeah, I'll let somebody ask that question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, so let me ask the first of these. Uh, does the donor experience Vibhatsa Rasa slash Jugupsa in meeting a preta that motivates him to transfer merit? Can we alternately see a different rasa evoked in a meeting in meeting a deva? Can we see any influence on Sanskrit Sanskrit poetics? I well, I really don't quite know how to tackle that. I'm dealing mainly with material which comes uh, from a few centuries before the turn of the Christian era. There were no Sanskrit poetics at all for about another thousand years. I think the uh, influence of one on the other is very implausible because the chronological gap is quite enormous. And the context, of course, in what is actually happening. I mean, you aren't supposed to feel uh, it's as for this, feeling disgusted when you see a praetor, I mean, it, all the texts assume that this is just a natural human reaction. Um, it's not that it's good, a good or bad thing, but you transfer the merit not because you feel disgust, but because you feel a certain amount of uh, some compassion and you're aware that you can do something to alleviate the terrible condition in which the praetor finds itself. I didn't think it's because of the disgust. Right, okay. I, I haven't been through the situation myself, so I can't be sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I have another question. Uh, Kate uh, says that, um, has a question from her student. Uh, the student asks about karmic consequences versus judgment. If our actions automatically have consequences, how does this affect Buddhist attitudes to active judgment and punishment, rather than just letting karma to play out? Well, for Buddhists, I mean, how things actually are panning out is for the most part unknowable. Although, of course, Buddhists may often consult um, monks or other wise people to see if they can have an insight into why something is happening and get the result uh, that well it's happening because of what you did uh, four million years ago. But uh, I mean that you uh, have a, a sort of punishment for a bad act you did because of somebody's judgment. That's just one of an infinite number of reasons why the bad result could come. You are, your own bad act is the original reason why it's happening and what mechanism the universe is using, so to speak. Obviously, that's very metaphorical because the un universe doesn't think, but that's the mechanism that the universe is using to ensure that you get your punishment. But it, of course, it, especially in the Mahayana, if you have been assiduously doing penances for your late, for your ancestors and you hope that your descendants will do it for you, there is a way out through these penances, which are in fact the, uh, how should I put it, the backbone of Mahayana Buddhism in China as a ritual system. They are, they're not just an incidental feature of the religion, they're the very backbone of it. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, there, there's another question. You mentioned penances. Here's another term from Christianity, uh, confession. So another student question uh, from Kate, uh, how does confession work in this idea of merit and demerit? Does it affect it? What about modern confession rituals in Taiwan to ask forgiveness from those one has karmically wronged in the past. Yes, I don't know um, enough about the ethnography of what goes on in Taiwan, but basically, if you go back to early Buddhism, um, a confession is a good, um, 
how shall I put it? Uh, confession is in one sense irrelevant, but it's like this. I, I do something bad, on a, uh, and then whether in the presence of the person I have wronged or, or not, it doesn't make a fundamental difference. I then come to see it as wrong, and I say, I, conf I admit that I did that and it was wrong. A a according to the way that early Buddhism sees it, you have not changed anything about the past. It's just that you have, as demonstrated by this instance, become a slightly better person. You now have a different moral view of that particular kind of act. You cheated somebody of 10 pounds. At the si time, you didn't probably feel very bad about it. You now realize you should, one should feel bad about cheating anybody of 10 pounds. And to that extent, I'm now a better person. But it's just a, a series of things, of intentions. First, there was a bad intention, which led to your taking away the money. Then later, there's a good intention, which makes you think uh, um, taking money is not a good thing to do, and I'll try not to do it again. But there, there's no, uh, no way in which the second cancels out the first. It's just first you are not good, and then you are good. And I'm afraid the sequence is sometimes another one that you uh, originally start off quite virtuous and you gradually corrupted and you become less good. Does that answer your point? I, I think it's very thorough. Um, I guess uh, Kate will let us know if, if that student has any anything to add there. Um, here's a question. Um, that's also on the chat. Uh, can you say more about destiny of pretas? Is it like a purgatory state? Well, um, we can only say that it's perhaps the closest thing there is to a purgatory state, but no, it isn't like a purgatory state. Because if nobody, uh, the poor old pretas, uh, if nobody passes on any merit to them, they can go on being a peta forever. Uh, this is, they were very interested, the Buddhists were interested in this too. And in late Theravada, there are subdivisions of uh, petas according to quite how bad they are and what's going to happen to them. But it's not really, it's a, it's a particular fixed status in the cosmos that they believe in. It comes below animals um, and above a being in hell. Of course, if you take it um, as part of a picture in which you think of what's the difference between being a pater and being in hell, you can say, well, not all that much. But a pater has, suffers from particular things the Peter suffers particularly from hunger and thirst, as a result of which they have very small mouths, or perhaps I should say the result is the other way around. Peters can never satisfy their hunger and thirst while they are Peters, because they have so, such small mouths that they can imbibe, take in very little food or drink. So uh, you can see that you were building this new cosmology, this cosmology for the Buddhists yourself and saying, what should we do? You would say to them, what's the point in having the Peters? We've, you've got your hell and so on. The point in having the Peters is a historical one. And there my lecture is entirely relevant because I show that the Peters are in fact inherited from pre-Buddhist India and from Brahmin versions of what happens to the dead, Brahmin versions of what happens to the dead, which to this day now in 2020 are not entirely obsolete. They are still in India who believe in these things and follow the practices which go with those beliefs. But a peta is not, a purgatory means that you are in a bad state and you somehow you can, uh, you're in a state in which you can atone for your misdeeds, um, but in the, the peters don't atone for their misdeeds unless they are helped to do so by 
hearing a sermon or something like that, having merit transferred to them. The merit being transferred to them doesn't mean that anything actually moves, but that your grandson, say, has um, done something very good and he tells you about it and therefore you are somewhat purified and if enough of that goes on, you will die as a praetor, although the death of the praetor is never actually described, you will die as a praetor and come back in a somewhat better station in slightly higher up the universe. Uh, thank you. Um, it's it's uh, five after 11 now. Um, I, I don't know, Professor Gombrich, if you have a few more minutes, there's a few more questions that I see on the chat. Are, are you okay to continue? I'm okay. Wonderful. Um, there's a, a question from Devon Jones on the chat. Thank you, Professor Gomber. Have you been able to identify any key moments in the development of Mahayana Buddhism when the understanding of merit transfer made the shift from shared intention to no shared intention? Well, of course, they never say, Divan, they never say we, we now have no shared intention. Uh, I don't think there's anywhere where they're explicit about rejecting the earlier situation. And of course, uh, if you do share intention, that's still all right for a Mahayanist. I doubt that there is a moment when this happens. I take it as a fundamental characteristic of what we think of as Mahayana, that you do think that merit can be transferred to any, all and ev every being in the universe just through the way that things are without their being in any particular mental state or you're having any personal connection with them. If I am a Mahayanist and I say, okay, I've done something good, I've given a, a, a lecture for Kate Crosby's seminar, I have some merit, what shall I do with it? I don't in Mahayana have to think, well, who would like to have this merit? I assume that anybody would. And therefore, I, I just utter a formula. Or, of course, there are other ways of doing it ritually. The Tibetans have prayer wheels and so on. Thank you. Um, here's another question on the chat uh, from Kiara. In this case of the transfer of merits, can Dakina be considered a synonym for Punya? Thank you in advance. Dakina is a, a synonym for Punya. Well, of course, punya is literally means a purifying act, and it's a metaphor taken over from Brahmanism to fit Buddhism into Brahminical categories, so that a good deed is a purifying deed. Um, and Dakina is similarly taken over, but a slightly different area of Brahmanism is what of what gives you the terminology. So Dakina is their gift to a Brahmin. So these come from slightly different areas of the culture, um, but uh, I think that the net, net result when they arrive in Buddhism is the same. I would have to really look up um, uh, Cone's dictionary to see what she says about Dakina. But I think the result is going to be the same. The dictionary has something. Um, Dakina, a gift, a donation the benefit or merit of a gift. So there's a long, long uh, article in Cone on Dakina, and it has three meanings in the way she says, well, the first is a gift or donation. Secondly is a fee, that's the archaic one, of course, coming from Brahminism. And then it's the benefit or merit of a gift. Well, if you make a gift in intentionally, I mean, if you really make a gift, 
rather than accidentally dropping the money or something, then uh, obviously it's a form of punya. So dakina is, as so often with these things, basically it's that words are being used in a slightly different context of what is going on, but their fundamental meaning is the same. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Kiara, let us know if, um, if you have any follow-up to that. Um, in the meantime, um, we have a, mess, a, a question from Sangamita uh, who asks, uh, if we say transferring merit does not work without the receiver being aware and rejoice on it, how about in the case of sending meta, would it work for the receivers who are not aware of it? Um, I think the answer must be no. Uh, according to whom, I have to uh, Do you mean um, according to certain living Buddhists or in, according to the, the Buddhist theory of it? Uh, it's not clear, maybe... Uh, I mean, you obviously, if you, if you write to me with Meta, it, it's an announcement uh, you are announcing to me that you feel meta for me. Um, it's perfectly possible, and I'm sure very often occurs, that one doesn't take this seriously. One just uh, turns to the next item in, li uh, in life and takes no particular notice of it. And so, of course, the re re receiving the meta could only be effective if I'm giving my own attention to it, my own motivation, if you like. I'm quite clear about that. Uh, yes, Sangamita writes in the chat, she's talking about uh, Buddhist theory. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Um, but so in the Metta Sutta, for instance, you announce the, that you, are, uh, you, have the you have the good intentions to del deliver Metta to all sentient beings. And that's a very good, a good thing for you to do. But it doesn't mean that all sentient beings are actually receiving anything. They have the potential to, but they don't really need to uh, be aware. We are not aware at this moment that, say, school children in Sri Lanka are reciting the Metta Sutta. And it's supposed, according to the wording, if you take it literally, to affect us. We just um, think, oh, it's good, these people are feeling a lot of metta. Perhaps I could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We're aware of their being kind people by the, their saying those words and meaning them. So we can become kind people. But that, it depends on our doing that. If we don't do it, nothing happens. So, okay. Okay, um, I have another uh, another uh, commentary from uh, Peter Harvey in the chat. Uh, Patas cannot get what they want. Those in hell experience much of what they do not want. Patas state more from greed, hell from hell more from hatred. Uh, where, where, I'm sure that must have a textual reference, Peter. No. I, I think it depends on what text you look at, because um, Lobha and Dosa, in other words, there's often a desire among commentators to say, well, there are three fires, um, passion, hatred, and delusion, and what are the different results of acting with passion or hatred or delusion, and they like to invent that there is one result or another. So I think that in strict Buddhist doxology, you can make out that there are cases where they differentiate the results, and in other cases, probably the earlier texts wouldn't attempt to do that. Um, it's the sort, that's the sort of question that I feel that the Buddha would have made fun of. 
<laughs> yeah, I agree that the specific link is only made in, I think, a Mahayana text. But it is said in the early text that hatred is a worse fault than greed. And clearly, the kind of descriptions of hell are far worse than the descriptions of the Pater state. You know, they're yeah. more a wanting, 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 which is kind of more naturally associated with greed, you might say. Yes, yes. And what, but it's not even wanting in general, it's wanting food and drink. Yes, yeah, okay. Although my modern kind of interpretation of Peters or image of them is going around a shopping centre at night when all the shops are closed. They can only window shop. They can't get what they want. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's my, my vision of hell. It's, it coincides with your version, your vision of being a Peter. Well, well, precisely. <laughs> well, yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we we have a question from Andrew Dade on the uh, chat. Um, he says uh, you mentioned the coincidence of widespread use of money in early Buddhism, and the development of the individual karma understanding. Correct. Yes. Yes. Indeed. And I this at some length in chapter two of um, what the Buddha thought. Okay, uh, okay, that's part of the answer that he, he's asking. Can you direct us to any more sources that might discuss this? So, so you said chapter two of... Yes, indeed. I give the references. To, um, it, the, the main source is a book, actually, that was written by Richard Seaford about money and the... I think it's called Money and the Greek Mind. Uh, sorry, not the... Um, uh, Yes, it was the poor bunny. Just a moment, if you hang on just a second, I think I can find it quickly because I've got the book almost at hand. Um, just a second. Yes, it's an interesting theory. 24 to 25. It's called Money and the Early Greek Mind. Yeah. Uh, how do you spell uh, Seaford? S E A F O R D. Thank you. He writes there's a striking similarity with what I've argued to be the socio economic preconditions for the roughly contemporary beginnings of Western philosophy. I wrote in my mind, Money and the Early Greek Mind. Um, the metaphysics of money involves the belief that we are primarily individual agents. Only secondary, if at all, members of a larger social ent entity. The individual with money, though he may find useful and desirable the personal relations, relations of kinship and friendship, that is reciprocity, as well as participation in collective sacrifices, that is redistribution, can frequently do without those things, relying instead on the impersonal power of money. The power of money can increase human independence even from deity. That's a longish quotation from Seaford. Well, the book would be about 10 years old by now. Excellent, okay. thank you. Um, Kate has had her hand raised for some time and I've been ignoring her. Um, so uh, Kate... <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Richard, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, you promised to connect this with your current work um, on Fogwashan, and I wondered if you could just say, say a little bit about your forthcoming book. Yes. Um, the book is going to be called uh, Chinese Buddhism as a World Religion. It's a rather teasingly paradoxical uh, thing. And I show how Fo Guang Shan, which uh, I became more and more interested in as I was writing the book, which I don't know if that uh, says something about me or about Fo Guang Shan, but anyway, Fo Guang Shan is fascinating because it combines what historically are so many different theories and attitudes of Buddhism and puts them together 
uh, if you re uh, if you take them as being said at the same time on the same day or something, it sounds as if the whole religion is utterly full of paradox. But in fact, I think it's very subtle. So um, the point is here really that um, the founder of Fogbangshan, the Venerable Xing Yun, um, was considered himself to be a disciple of Tai Xu. Um, he had very little contact with Tai Xu, but Tai Xu, when Xing Yun was a very, very young monk, I suppose about uh, 20, um, came and gave a course at his monastery. I don't think he was ever really the personal disciple of Tai Xu, but then later he wrote, and this I've recorded in um, the uh, in the thing that, which Peter published in the Buddhist Studies Review, um, which was, uh, sorry, um, Do you want me to find about it? Christi uh, 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 the, um, Christianity is an analog. happened here. Hello, Professor Gombrich, are you still there? Oh, I think he is. Uh, I see that I see in my chat he has left the conversation. Has he as he accidentally as he his line uh, dropped, I think. Maybe, maybe we should give him a moment to um, yeah, to get to back on back. again. Um, uh, I, I wonder if he knocked the computer looking for something. Um, um, if we do, <laughs> do get him back, um, so, uh, Angela, how long would you like to continue to? Should we round things up by the half past the hour? Uh, yes, that's that sounds good. Um, by the way, uh, Professor Gombrich was trying to, well, you mentioned an article of his in Buddhist Studies Review, uh, 2017, volume 34, issue two. Christianity is a model, an analog in the formation of humanistic Buddhism of Tai Tzu and Xin Yong. That's by him and... Can you give me the um, details again, Peter? I'm just going to type these in the chat. Right. So Buddhist Studies right. Review. Buddhist Studies Review, 2017. That's volume 34, number two. Yeah. And it's Christianity as a model and analogue. Yeah. In the formation of, quote, humanistic Buddhism of Tai Tzu and Sin Yun. I don't know how to spell the second name. Tai Chu and. Um, oh, sorry. A S I N G. Yeah. Yun, and then Sin Yun. Sorry, I U N. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I did get it. Great. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, Paul Richard, I hope he's finding his way back, but it's, it seems like he's been reborn into a different realm. <laughs> I, uh, let's see. Um, he, we did go through two ways of him joining us, so hopefully he'll come soon. But um, in, in case he does not, perhaps uh, we could um, <laughs> put our thanks in the chat because the chat will still go through to him. Uh, after after the end of the session. Um, I was just looking up to see if his latest publication list is on the Oxford Centre of Buddhist Studies and I uh, link. I'm just going to put the link to the Oxford Centre of Buddhist Studies anyway because people can get in touch and find um, Professor Gombridge in, through it. So I'll just put that in the chat. Um, I will also see if he would give us the latest list of his publications, if it's not on the OCBS site, which I don't think it is, so that we can put them up on the 
um, transnational network Theravada studies site, um, which uh, uh, if people haven't um, been to that, it's I'll put the website in now. Okay. Um, Could I speak up for abolishing the term transfer of merit? At the very least, it's sharing of merit, if merit's the right word. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right. Draw attention to. Um, right. Well, I think that Richard hasn't rejoined us, so I think we might end um, end the session uh, now. So I just wanted to um, rejoice in Richard Gomch's merit for giving us this talk and also for uh, teaching so many of us and um, and publishing so widely and in such an accessible form. And um, since he mentioned um, you know, giving to those in need or feeding those in need, I thought we could also rejoice in merit at the um, uh, awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to the United Nations Food Agency, the World Food Programme. Um, so that is the latest news. And so thereby, by rejoicing in their merit, we're sharing in the feeding of over 97 million people each year. So um, yes, we're rejoicing in that merit too, as appropriate to the talk. Um, and we will finish the um, recording now. Um, if people want to stay on, I hope that Richard will come back or just want to chat with each other, please do.